Hey VC20, welcome back once again. Uh, I'm gonna get us started with a little bit of worship tonight. And uh, before I do that, I would just encourage you, wherever you're at, maybe take a second and forget about what it is that you were doing today, what you're doing tomorrow, and just turn your attention to the Lord with me. I'm gonna pray, invite God's presence to be with us, and then we'll worship together. So would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you tonight first and foremost, with grateful hearts to give you thanks for all that it is that you've done for us, all of the ways in which you've been faithful to us. I pray, Lord, as we begin to worship, that you would actually call to mind ways in which you've been constant in our life, ways in which you have changed our situation with your love and with your grace and your mercy. Thank you, God, for who you are. I pray, Lord, that this worship would be honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God has 
How we love to be near you How we love your presence
presence now. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God that draws close to us. That we can experience you tangibly, personally. And Lord, we just ask for more know that when it comes to you that there's always more to be found so we ask for more of your presence here with us tonight Yo, VC20, what's up, y'all? Um, are those supposed to be bunny ears? There, it's, yeah, okay. uh, it's good try, good effort. Um, hey, just wanted to to give you a couple updates. Uh, so this weekend, I had intended to record an original message regarding racial injustice and everything happening in our country in light of the brutal murder of George Floyd. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to. There's our voice because I had heart surgery, but uh, I'm happy to report that my procedure went really well. I'm home and recovering right now. So instead, I wanna point you to two places. The first one is what we're gonna to air tonight here at VC20. We're gonna air a condensed version of a, of a Zoom conversation that we had. We were led by four of our black leaders, Xavier Smith, John O'Ray Cole, Jeremy Sams, and Bentu Kanu. And they shared very candidly about their personal processing and experience of being black in America thought that was super insightful. I also really, really encourage you, if you missed it, to check out Pastor Rich's message from this weekend. It was a, a poignant and necessary call primarily to white evangelicals to repent and to not miss this moment, to, to respond and to stand in solidarity with our black and brown brothers and sisters and fight for justice and equity for all people. It was powerful. It was an on-time word. I, I believe it's seminal. It's going gonna, it's gonna to impact the future of Vineyard Columbus. So please, please, please check those out. Uh, Elise, do you want to give an encouragement? Yeah, this is just geared towards everyone, but very much pointed at our people of color in our community. Um, and it's a word that, uh, in part, Dr. Butler, Dr. Lathania Butler, gave to me um, when I was just struggling and having a hard time processing things and feeling myself slipping into, um, you know, hopelessness. And, um, and the word is to cultivate joy, to fight for joy. We are always called to fight for our joy and to cultivate joy. And I think that especially when times are hard, it can feel like that joy is being taken away from you. But I want to encourage you as a brown person, as a black person, as a white person, Asian person, always to focus on cultivating joy and to focus on enjoying Christ in front of people. Um, to claim for him to, to claim him as as better mm -hmm. as best yeah. that this world is not home we know this and so to live that out to walk that out that doesn't mean we bury our, our heads in the sand and not fight for justice and not fight when we see things that are wrong but it does mean we claim Christ as we move into those things so that our joy isn't sucked from us and stolen from us and replaced with things that the world wants to place on us um, whether that is uh, feeling like we are we are less than or, or not good enough or not like other people and not worthy, da, da 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 So we need to make sure we are fighting for joy. Fight for joy, cultivate joy. Amen. I'm going to wrap this up because my arm is getting tired holding this uh, camera. We got an apparatus here. We got a whole uh, rig. But uh, 
It is an excavator, Miles. Um, I, I would add to that, you know, if you are doing anything, I encourage you to do something. Do something, whether it's protesting, whether it's donating, whether it's having difficult conversations, whether it's uh, turning inward and doing the hard work of repentance. Do something. Uh, and, and as Diedrich Bonhoeffer says, God responds to passionate prayers and responsible action. So partner your prayer with action. I would also encourage you to, to stay the course and keep the faith. And I don't mean that as some, some trite, hollow phrase. I mean, by keeping the faith, I mean keeping Jesus at the center and, and recognizing that this is a very much a spiritual issue. And, and pace yourself so that you can be in the fight over the long haul. How do we sustain the movement beyond the moment? Um, and so, so stay strong, y'all. Uh, also, just before we wrap up, I do want to encourage you to tune in to the In Between podcast. You can check it out live on Facebook tomorrow night, featuring two of our very own Malik Sammons and Fatima Ba. We are so proud of y'all. So proud of everybody who's protesting. Proud of you for donating, giving, praying, conversing, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, we're proud of you. We're standing with you. Uh, so again, we're going to turn you to the Zoom call that we had this past Tuesday night. Check out Pastor Rich's message from this weekend. Tune into the in-between on Monday. Oh, here's an important thing. We are kicking off next week. We're returning to our sermon series entitled Poetic Justice. This is the sermon series that we cut off when uh, quarantine hit. Been holding on to this and wanting to do it live with y'all, but it just feels so timely and prophetic. So start spreading the word now. I feel like I have a word for y'all starting next Sunday. Um, and so make sure you tune in for that. Bring a friend, be a bringer. And uh, that's all I got. You want to say anything else? We love you so much. We We're love praying for you. Yeah. We're so thankful to be a part of this community with you. Amen. Check this out. See y'all. Begin by asking these four, four beautiful people to share very personally and very honestly about their existence of being black in America and then particularly how they're processing uh, recent events. So for me, I was born in Baltimore, like Baltimore City, Maryland. Um, and I mean, from growing up, you know, the, the talk, I guess, of like, you're black and these, this is like what America means to you because you are black. Um, people look at you this way. The police look at you this way. So that was something that is just like life that, that was just life to me as as sure as gravity is that was as sure to me um and i think i just understood that from a young age um and in light of events now um especially the most recent uh i think when i saw reports and videos for george floyd um you're, I mean, even though it's the same thing over and over, you're always just like taken aback. Like, what is this really happening? And nothing. Like, what, what's going on? Um, and then almost immediately, just like that's that's kind of life. Like that's where we are as a society, and sadly, that's what that's what happens. Um, so after like the first like taking it back that shock the next that I usually feel is just like sad like really sad to think that kind of this is where we are as um, like as a black man in America my life can be taken and like there are no repercussions so whereas I think justice and those type of things can be found in the courtroom or by the police for other people since they aren't found there for me. Like I could, I can't rely on the police or the government or anything like that. Um, you just kind of feel really sad and almost hopeless. So, um, I think with these recent events, um, the stage of processing that I'm in is that, that hopelessness that, you know, um, when will things change um, and will they ever change? Yes, yeah, so um, I think for me, 
uh, growing up in America has been I think very unique. My parents actually came over from Sierra Leone in West Africa. And so I was born and raised here in Columbus, Ohio, um, I think with a Sierra Leonean background. Um, so it's kind of a unique, um, yes, I'm African American, but um, I'm African in a sense where my parents came straight from Sierra Leone. And so a bit of the culture, um, I think, from Sierra Leone and then the American culture has kind of um, mixed and kind of um, has been the, the part of what my upbringing has been. And so I think when it comes to like my experience just growing up, I, ne I didn't necessarily struggle um, when it comes to feeling almost like, I don't know what the right words are, but I think my most important issue was making sure that the teacher would pronounce my name right. Like I didn't really deal with a lot of racial issues growing up in Westerville actually, um, and attending Westerville schools. But with that being said, um, I didn't really understand what um, the actual struggles were holistically being black in America. I mean, we had textbooks and we learned what was in the textbook, but that wasn't necessarily everything. And so it wasn't until college where um, I'm so grateful for our African American Research Cultural Center at the University of Cincinnati, um, where new, um, I think, just what it means to, to grow up as an African American in America, the struggles that come along with that were slowly being revealed to me in depth. And I find myself in heartache, really, um, just not only in the recent events, but just in these past couple of years, we've seen countless acts of what we're seeing now on TV, you know, um, with George Floyd, um, all, all these names, we can list them. And I see it a lot from almost, I think what, what hurts a lot is thinking about the mothers and the parents of these individuals that are losing their lives day after day. And I say day after day because we only talk about what we see in terms of what's reported, but not everything that happens is reported. So I'm finding myself in a really, um, in just pain, but also um, that bended me um, with just understanding Understanding truly what it means to be black in America in terms of oppression. So, yeah, yeah like I, I find myself like in a mix of of a lot of emotions, like anger, frustration, shame, um, like grief, and uh, I just kind of feel like whenever these kind of things like happen, it always hits me from 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 every kind of angle. Um, I'm Filipino and black. And so for myself, like, uh, I realized early on by proxy of how I look that I get a choice of whether or not I ascribe and, and admit to being black to other people. Um, I could literally go my entire life without ever outwardly expressing that, that I am black, right? People will be fine with that by, by the way that I look, you know? And so I, I think that, when I did make the conscious decision early on in my life of like, no, I'm not gonna run from this. I'm not gonna run from this heritage that I look to the fact that like, there is immense violence against black people in this country, like in the face. And, and, and I know it to be true. Like it, situations like this at, at this point in my life, like don't shock me anymore. It's more of a matter of time for me um, of when another one gets reported, right, of when, another officer walks free or, or I know that officer Chauvin is, is currently in custody, but like a matter of when the compatriots come and, and, and defend him and write up reports that, that show him as a good man or not at fault in these kind of situations. Um, and so I'm not shocked by, by that. I think, I think this time around felt a little closer considering a lot of, considering the, the mass protests in Columbus 
And alongside with that, like the the rioting that has happened, the looting that has happened, right? Shops that that I grew up going to and, and loving so much, like Soul Classics downtown, you know, getting looted and and, and everything. Like it, it definitely feels a little more close to home this time around. Um, and and it almost never feels like I, I I get a chance to 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 like fuss about and and like be angry. Um, cause I'm a leader and like, I lead in high school and like this happened, like all this kind of came to a head on, on, on a Saturday really. And it's like, I got a group on Monday. Right. And so, and what's expected is that I have, I have an answer, right. I have a call. I have, I have measures in place to, to give to my students. Right. And that's, and that's so hard to feel like you have to express ship your, your emotions and, and your feelings to these kind of things. Um, I think for myself, like I find myself frustrated with the church as well, particularly frustrated with a lot of my peers that that I know that I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I talk about racism. I talk about these kind of things. I, I make it a point to bring it up when when the cameras aren't rolling, and and I find myself like in a place of anger towards those that I know that ignore those conversations that blatantly step away you know that blatantly do not pay attention to the sermons that blatantly do not take the classes that blatantly do not come around right until the bodies start falling and all of a sudden they want to be be here on social media they want to send all the texts and everything like that right when when like you you were warned in advance of of things like this you were warned that that this country is prone to this to this kind of situation right and so I find myself frustrated in that and, and working through that hatred and, and working through, through, through those emotions too. And, and I find myself working through the frustration that people are even shocked by this, right? Like as if this, as if racial tension like is not even a theme throughout the Bible, throughout the entirety of the New Testament. Like, as like, I don't, it, it frustrates me. And, and I wonder, I'm like, how do you get, how do you get to being a Christian for, for, for a decade plus, right? How do you get to being a Christian for five years plus? And, and, and we say, and we, you know, that, that we read the Bible and that we love the word and everything, but you don't even pick up on the racial tensions, right? And you don't even pick up on the parallels that are happening right now, right? And, you, and we don't even see that history continues to, to repeat itself, right? And so it's like, I, I don't know, it, it frustrates me because it's like, how are you shocked yet you tell me you read the scriptures, right? You've been reading about this for years if you haven't been lying to me, right? Um, so, it, 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 you know, I find myself frustrated there of like, how the heck are so many of my peers not as prepared as they are for this, you know? Um, and so that's, that's where I always find, find myself of, um, of like, there's there's work to be done, and and I always wish that that we were further along than we are, right? Um, and so, and I think a lot of that has just resurfaced and like come up in, in this time around. I mean, when, when I think about how I feel now, I told someone recently, like I feel so much. It's like you can feel so much that you feel numb. So I've been trying to sit with it and be like, what the heck do I actually really feel? Like, what is the like root emotion? And I think my root emotion is anger. I'm angry. I'm angry at the powers that be, the systems that are in place, that are hell-bent on quenching the inalienable rights of minority citizens. Um, I'm angry at the fact that this diabolical, twisted, wicked spirit of murder has continuously for years on years on years on years, biblical times to now been like targeting my people um, up to the point where we're seeing George Floyd. You know, we have multiple names, Alton Sterling, Tamir Rice, the list goes on. Um, I'm angry at the fact that I see my black brothers and my black dad who's a very black man uh, with his eyebrows furrowed in his face and them pondering why George Floyd did everything he was supposed to do and still die, like supposed to do quote unquote, so that please put all types of like collectives in that cause or uh, 
what's that grammatical term? Whatever, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, well, he was like, whatever he was supposed to do um, and still passed away. Um, and I'm, I'm wanting the church to do something. Like I'm thirsty for the church to seek the Lord for an answer, to seek the Lord for something that's specific to this time, to seek, to seek the Lord for, for supernatural answers. Um, because yeah, I am frustrated. Thank you, Jonna. Um, X, I want to pitch this one to you because I know this is something you've thought extensively about. Uh, I'm not sure if this is true of anybody on this call. Perhaps it is. But what would you say to the person who says, you know, I'm not a racist. What's the big deal? Somebody who is oblivious to the realities of systemic racism and oppression and the ways in which we are complicit and contribute to these systems that are, are the odds are stacked against our black and brown brothers and sisters. We sh- it is it is an oversimpli- oversimplification to apply racist versus not racist because we do not apply that same that sameness to sin to sinful and not sinful right when we are forgiven of our sins all of a sudden you know we shouldn't fall into the mindset of like hallelujah I'm forgiven and I can never sin again right because then that puts us in a shameful mentality for when we do sin. Rather than falling back into the lap of the Lord, we fall into the lap of shame and guilt. And it pulls us away from the church and it pulls us away from Christ and it pulls us away from our our peers. And it's the same way there, right? Everything that we do in matters of justice should pull us closer to the black community, should pull us closer to, to each other in this matter, right? Dr. Martin Luther King, in a lot of his speeches, he often talks about the intertwining destinies of the black and white community, right? That our mutual survival, our mutual prosperity, whether that be physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually are intertwined, right? And that's so true, right? We are of one body, uh, you know, as it says in the Bible, right? And we may serve in different parts, but we are of one body. And when the foot is hurt, right? The eyes do not avert itself of the pain joint, right? It looks upon that pain. And the hand reaches down to that pain and soothes it. And it may not be the thing that ultimately heals it, but it is there, right? And so when we see the pain of our brothers and sisters, the idea is not to separate that body part, to separate from that pain, but to look upon it and reach towards it, right? And that is where the idea of racist or not racist fails. The fact of the matter is, is that all of you are racist. Bintu is racist. John is racist. Jeremy is racist. I'm racist. Shane's racist, right? And I say that because it's, it's a sin, right? Racism is a sin and it is something that lives in all of us. It is something that, that, that we can't help but succumb to sometimes, whether that be consciously or unconsciously, right? And so in the same matter that we have to accept that we fall to sin sometimes, we have to accept that we fall to racism sometimes, right? We've all been conditioned in some ways very great to respect others. And in other ways, we've been conditioned poorly to 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 respect others and to love others and everything. Um, the, a, a common term going on right now trying to replace the idea of racist and not racist is the idea of anti-racism, right? Um, and, you know, you can roll your eyes at the term or whatever. Like, it, it, I, I don't care what you think of the term. You can use whatever term you want, right? But I think the idea of anti-racism, I think, is is so much more helpful, right? And it's, the, it's a matter of... of not am I in a state of racism or am I a state of non-racism, right? It is acknowledging that we all have inherent biases, that we all have this inherent tendency to, to, to favor the, the people and ethnic groups that we like, right? Whether that be our own, whether that be others, right? And it faces that and pushes forward towards justice anyways, right? It looks it in the face and pushes forward anyways, right? A lot of this is contemporarily outlined in, in Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be, um, How to Be Anti-Racist. I highly recommend reading this book and picking it up. You won't borrow my copy, you can borrow my copy. Not in, not at this time, you know, considering Corona, but you can buy an audio book, you can, you know, you can purchase it from a bookstore or whatever. I highly recommend reading it, right? And also, too, we see this, we see this very convincingly outlined in the New Testament as well, right? In the efforts of, of particularly Paul and Barnabas, 
they basically throughout the New Testament are on a world tour of trying to get the, the Jews and the Gentiles to integrate in the church, right? At this point, the early church is, is at a time of turmoil, right? The, the veil has been torn. Jesus has died and been resurrected. And, and the high of, and the high has, and the spiritual high has worn off. And now these people have to figure out like, oh, shoot, we are Jews and Gentiles. You know, just, just a while back, um, the, the Gentiles weren't even allowed within the inner, the inner sanctums of the temple. And now they're all supposed to be together, right? That's not fixed overnight, right? That takes, that takes hard fought conversations and uncomfortability and, and, and they work through those things, right? And so Paul and Barnabas are going on this, to use contemporary terms, I guess, this anti-racist uh, um, tour and everything. And I could go blue in the face giving all the different examples of how they address a lot of situations we already find ourselves in. Um, so, I'll stop, so I'll stop it right there. But um, that's why, to, to summarize, I guess, the idea of racist versus not racist is, is unhelpful because we do not put the same constraints on ourselves when it comes to sin. We are not either sinful or not sinful, right? We, we, we succumb to sin, right? And when we succumb to racism in the same way, we do not fall before the altar of, of black people, right? We don't seek black people out and ask them to absolve us of our sins, right? We don't seek media that entrenches us in our, in our, in our inlaid ideas, right? We bring that before the Lord. And we come before the Lord and say, God, I have sinned and I repent and fill me with your wisdom and change me, right? It's just, you know, and, and so it's the same deal. And in that way, is God supplants, you know, anti-racist theology and, and, and desires in our hearts. And sometimes that looks like just reaching out to people. And sometimes that looks like actual action and, and things. And I could go on theory crafting the many different situations that you could find yourself in. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I'll leave it at. Thanks, X, man. I really appreciate your, your insight on that. Um, here's, here's a related question, and, and this is for any of you to tackle. But uh, one of the, the common emotions that I'll mention was a sense of, of hopelessness. And, and I think that's an emotion that many of us are sharing in. And so I'm curious, how do you deal with that hopelessness? And, and maybe more specifically, X, you, you, you started preaching on this just now. Uh, what, what, what hope does Scripture afford us? What hope does the reality of Jesus and, and the truth of the gospel afford us in the midst of, of despair and, and what seems to be insurmountable darkness? And um, I think in Isaiah specifically, we're reminded, um, I think the Scripture is like, learn to do good seek justice, correct oppression, you know, bring justice to the fatherless. And I think it's very clear, um, seeking justice, it's it, in, in, in a time when you're hopeless, it's, it's possible. I think to be able, it starts with conversations like this, to be able to have time to, to sit down and really um, learn from your peers, learn from one another, to sit down and, and, pray and worship in the midst, I think, um, just being able to, to remember what God tells us um, in times where we can't even have a clear thought. I think Jana even mentioned this, literally asking ourselves, what am I feeling right now? You know, giving, literally laying how our questions at the altar. Um, I think we're told in countless ways to love our brothers and sisters like ourselves in the wood, right? To not judge by appearance. Um, all these different things are just running in my head. Um, and I think it just leads to the ultimate hope and peace um, that God has intended for us to, to really just live our lives by and um, to really make justice here on earth, to really live out our lives in justice, not just sitting down and, and seeing the, the pain day after day after day and saying, wow, we need a change, but being a part of that change and knowing that there's community and, and allowing yourself to engage in the conversations that are hard. Um, I think putting yourself in a place where you're able to um, ask the questions that you're typically scared of asking or um, having the conversations that nearly bring you to tears, but we have to have them, right? Um, in a sense, it brings hope. I think I would say, um, and I just, I think 
it, in the end all be all that, you know, we're reminded that one day there will be perfect justice because God is a just God. Um, but in the meantime, evil is here and it's throughout, it's here throughout, you know, all over our world. And so I think together as a body and as a people, we have the duty to not only know about the injustices that are going on, but to pursue justice, to literally pursue justice. And when you think about the definition of, of pursuit, it literally means to go after, to run after to follow and might one might like even define it as persistently chasing in this context but that brings hope to to know that your brothers and sisters are oppressed but you've been given the opportunity to to literally seek after that and be a part of um hope to literally be a part of peace to 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 use your voice to let your actions um reflect your reaction you know so i would just i would say that um i want to uh, take a bit of a turn and, and jeremy i'm going to start with you but uh been to jana x feel free to chime in um one of the consequences of uh particularly the the murder of george floyd has been people reconsidering relationship to the police and uh, should we defund the police? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of emotions uh, across a really, really broad spectrum regarding police and, and people in power and authority. So Jeremy, I would love to hear just your, your experience as a black man in dealing with the police and, and what do you think should our posture be when it comes to uh, dealing with the police force? What, what should our not just our posture and actual interaction, but what should our thoughts toward them be? And, and maybe just direct our heart. Yeah. Hear your um, experience first there, Jeremy. For sure. Um, I guess, well, to set some of the context, like I said, I was born in Baltimore. And that's where I grew up, where um, a lot of the, I don't know, police tactics weren't, I don't even know how to how to say they just weren't weren't good. So stop and frisk or these guys are in a group. They look like they might be doing something. So I'm going to just pull them over, handcuff them, check their pockets, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like my context. And that's how I grew up, like seeing the police. But I like now as I'm older, I think to um like put the police in the in a box of all police are bad or, or all police are racist um we'll be doing what we're accusing them of um where they put us like we believe they put us in the box black people are um rowdy and they're murderers or whatever we want to be um so i think as christians we are not called to um, just like reverse that hate. Like, okay, well, they hate us, so we're just going to hate them. Um, or at least we believe they hate us. Um, so I think as Christians, we're, we're called to, to forgive. I mean, as, as, as hard as that sounds, we're called to forgive and to love. Um, so when it comes to police, I don't, when I interact with police, I don't expect that every um policeman that I run into is trying to lock me up. Um I'm not thinking that every cop is trying to kill me every time I see one. Like I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, you know? Um but with that being said, I'm like super nice like if a cop comes out, I'm super nice. Hey, how you doing? great you know like i'm just trying to be as nice and cordial as possible because i want to be alive um and that's the reality of the situation um so i think as and i guess it's, it's two sides being black or being like uh white or whatever at least the you are um there's probably different advice for each but i think as a whole as a body of christ we're we're not called to 
just say all the police are the same. We need to defund them and they're all terrible. There are lots of good policemen. There are lots of Christian policemen who, who want justice. Um, a lot of people in the courts, a lot of judges that like truly do want what's right. Um, but I think racism is like a spirit of darkness that like, it's not something that easy to just come out. Like this is something that's been with human beings, even as extra sand for like all of eternity. So it's not something that's easily overcome. Um, but I don't think we're called to, to like not love or not forgive as hard as like, I'm saying the words and it's really hard, <laughs> but I, I think that's what we're called to do as, as Christians. Um, I don't agree with our current overemphasis of the, uh, of the systematic and the diminishing of the personal, because those two things are, are intertwined with each other and we have to treat it as such, right? Jim Crow did not make the racist white man in, in the 50s and 60s, right? It was the racist white man that implemented Jim Crow that allowed the actions of people like them to continue on and to be seen as just and to be seen as the norm, right? And to be seen as okay, right? Same thing goes on today, right? There's not specific legislation giving police officers the 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 um, the the go ahead, the explicit go ahead to to murder young black people, to murder all black people of all ages, right? But at the same time. There are no laws and regulations sufficient enough to stop the police officers that want to partake in that, right? And, and I'll give you all this quote from, from Dr. Martin Luther King. This comes from his 1967 speech called The Other America. He gave several versions of this. I'm pulling from his 1967 address at Stanford University. Um, and, and in this speech, he says, and so I realized that if we are to have a truly integrated society men and women will have to rise to a majestic height of obedient to the unenforceable. But after saying this, let me say another thing which gives the other side. And that is that although it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, behavior can be, leg can be regulated. Even though it may not be true that law cannot change the heart, it can restrain the heartless. Even though it, it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, it can restrain him from lynching me. And I think that's pretty important also. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it can, it can, it can and it does change the habits of men. And when you begin to change the habits of men, pretty soon the attitudes will change. Pretty soon the hearts will be changed. And I'm convinced that we still need strong civil rights legislation, right? And, and let that wash over you, let that pain you how true a statement from 1967 still speaks so much to our current moment, right? And to summarize what he's talking about is that yes, of course, we can't regulate everything in our lives, right? That's just called, uh, you know, that's just an empire, right? That's just putting too much power on one hand, right? That's going against the what we believe that, that God is the judge, right, in this. But at the same time, like he says, morality cannot be legislated. And that's true, right? There's no law that any of us could write, that will write onto the, the, the hearts of men and women that like, oh yeah, now I do love black people, right? But it can, but like he says, behavior can be regulated. And right now in the system of the police force, there is not sufficient regulation in order to stop the police officers that are heartless, that do see means to, 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 to end those that they see as hateful or, or, or a stain on society or the ones that blatantly hate black people and those that are unlike them, right? I think it's undeniable that those regulations are not there and those checks and balances are not there, right? They don't, we don't even have the regulations to protect protesters, right? And protesters fall across, uh, across this nation right now, fall across all racial and ethnic spectrums, right? And so that's what I'm saying, right? There are some good officers there. And I hope and I pray that one day, and I hope and I pray that right now, they see, they see the ripple effects of when the heartless are able to regulate systems, right? A man died, a man is murdered in, in Minneapolis and it causes looting, 
and rioting and pain and suffering in Columbus, Ohio. And that should haunt police officers, right? That should haunt them into, the, into their workday when they put on that uniform, right? That should haunt them, right? Just as any of us that call ourselves teachers, any of us that call ourselves small group leaders, it should haunt us how much power and influence we have over those that trust us, right? And it should check us. And there should be rules that check us, right? Great stuff, X. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a turn here and talk about actionable steps that we can take as a community to combat injustice and affect change? I think there's good work that takes place when we let God pull out us in him, if that makes sense. So like when we come alive in Christ, when we allow him to pull out, you know, all the gifts and talents and just ideas and dreams and visions that he's placed inside of us and we allow him to breathe on that and let them come to life and we then become, uh, become, become changers, we change our environment, the environments that we're in. So I think one practical way as a believer, since we're talking to believers, um, is allowing God to call out your purpose and like being comfortable with who you are. And I think how you fit in this framework of um, fighting for justice for like a family unit. Like, are you a storyteller? Are you good at taking people's stories and you know, incubating them and then giving them back to the world in a way that's palpable. Are you a visionary? Do you catch visions? Do you see far? Do you, know how, do you see the abstract and know how to paint a picture? Um, are you an organizer? Are you a helper? Like, how do you fit in? How do we fit into this larger narrative of uh, kingdom building and establishing? Um, find that, I think, and being attentive also to the fact, uh, and one thing I'm learning in my own personal life, is that allowing the light to shine in the darkness and calling the darkness for what it is. Like, I think it's really easy to just uh, brush stuff under the rug, act like stuff isn't there. But when we get real and then we get into the nitty gritty and realize that, hey, I'm actually really dealing with like a little bit of bigotry. I'm dealing with like, I don't really like you because of this, this, and that. Like, I don't really know how to engage with you. I'm feeling some dissonance with you in this area. Like letting the light shine and being aggressive in letting the light shine in the dark places and calling the darkness out for what it is because Satan lives being able to fester where there's secrecy, where there's darkness. Um, so yeah, let the light shine. I think also um, opening up your palate. So I don't know how people do it, but I can't do mono meals. Like I can't eat something like the same meal every day of the week. Can't do it. <laughs> um, I think the same thing should go for our circles. Um, what does it look like? You know, sometimes I want some Taiwanese food. Sometimes I want some Brazilian cuisine. Sometimes I want some French bread. Like, I don't know, I'll switch it up. But, and let, let those relationships speak to you, you know, and it, it puts a face on these people. These people become a name, they become a person, they, they get a heartbeat. Um, and I have a for me, myself as well. I feel like there's some intentional ways as believers uh, that, that we can take, like make change in our own space. Also, sorry, if I speak, um, meaningful conversations. Actually, I was talking to someone, about, like, someone I care about, and they were talking about how the multiplier effect and how, like, I know we post, there's nothing wrong with posting. Um, sometimes I feel like it's a little reactionary and it's not very, uh, I don't know. Activism is vigorous work. So, you know, it's a good platform, but there's more to it than just posting. And that goes for all of us, I think, especially in our generation. But there's beauty in the intimacy of conversation. There's beauty um, in like getting to like iron sharpening iron. And I imagine that when you get into the nitty gritty with someone you trust, whether that be somebody of the same ethnicity, same thought, same uh, socioeconomic status or someone outside of that, uh, you open yourself up to having moments of paradigm shifting, and that very ca can be a catalyst for someone else. And it's like a the multiplier effect. So I think that all of those combined are kind of like practical ways that you can we can go about um, really making change in our own space. Uh, thank you as well, Jonna, for sharing. I mean, I would just add quickly, you know, protesting if you feel led. Um, you know, justice isn't enacted overnight. We got to think in decades, not in 
Rockies. And so I'm, I'm praying longevity for my young bucks whose sensibilities have been ignited by these inciting incidents that you would stay the course and for the long haul. But we are seeing, you know, some signs of life from Mayor Ginther, however you feel about how late it was, you know, there, there are things happening. So if you feel led to protest, if you're already protesting, we're proud of y'all. Um, if you feel led, you know, whatever time you have to give matters. If you don't feel led and you're weary and tired, don't, don't feel guilty. You know, you have to process and you have to take action in your own way. Um, I would encourage us as a community, one really practical call to action is to assume the mantle of intercession, you know, because this is a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual matter. And uh, many people ask, well, where is God in all this? And, and I, I believe that God is the one that has pulled back the veil on the gross sin of racism in our nation. And, and his promises are still sure to comfort those who are mourn. And, and he's near to the broken right now.